Currently we're investigating the possibility of having a group of products that all allow uh, data portability between them. So the user can be constructing and simulating various aspects of a larger world. Uh, perhaps I want to uh, build a house or build a city or design a car or whatever. I should be able to buy a product that allows me to explore that and then when I'm done I can take that house or car or city and place it into my world model. So really the data set that we're dealing with is additive. These aren't islands of data you know sitting with each product but really there's a large set of data that I can slowly be building over time much the way somebody might build a model train set and slowly get into the various aspects of the terrain and the village and the switching. I can pick whichever aspect of this world interests me the most and I can author it. And I can go into that world, move around in it, interact with it, and perhaps even meet other users in it as it becomes a shared world. Well, the important thing about the data type is that if we design it correctly, we can take that data out of a game and import it into another game. And by doing this, we will be able to, in the future, allow our games to connect, interface, and share data whenever applicable. So that as you buy our products, it will be more like you're buying an addition to a library of tools rather than a standalone game that you'll play for two or three weeks and get tired of. For instance, uh, when we came out with SimCity 2000, we provided an upgrade path to the users so they could take their original cities from SimCity Classic and move them into SimCity 2000. The user, when they play our games, that's what they're really creating. When they build a city and they spend all the time designing the intricacies of their city, it's that data set that they're creating. Now, they don't care you know, how much of the code that we have in SimCity 2000 came from the original SimCity. What they care about is they can take their masterpiece from SimCity Classic and move it into SimCity 2000. So that's the reuse that I think really matters to the consumer. The kind of games we do, as I said, are very dependent on process, uh, more so than structure. So the faster CPUs that are coming into the market um, are a great help to us because we can really make a much more believable world. And the kind of worlds that we make tend to be socially based. Um, they're about real systems, uh, things that real people interact with, like cities. Uh, in the future, I think our games are going to evolve to be even more social. Um, beyond just the subjects being social, also the way people play them. They will play them with each other, they will discuss them, they will trade data types. Uh, so as networking technology advances, we will start you know, having multiplayer versions. Um, we'll look at ways that these simulations can become basically a communications media between people around things they create, around ideas that they're exploring, around issues. I like building things, and uh, I build things at kind of a metal level because what I do now is I build things that allow other people to build things. Um, I spent a lot of time growing up building models, and I've always loved building models. And here we're giving tools to the users where they can build very elaborate models of things that exhibit behavior, uh, which are the kind of models I could never build when I was a kid. I was using plastic and balsa wood. Um, so the idea of building a model that's alive and that exhibits behavior is really fascinating to me. We want to build a world inside the computer that's so lifelike that after a few minutes the user stops thinking of this as a computer game. Uh, they start thinking of it as a little microcosm inside their computer. And then they're thinking about the forces impacting the people in their city or whatnot, and not about the fact that they're playing a game and if they push this button, that happens. So really we're trying to build the believable behavior inside the computer that they can relate to. When the users play our games, they come to the game with a certain set of experiences, certain expectations. They have, for instance, a model of the way cities work in their mind. Uh, when they play our game, what we're in essence trying to do is challenge their model, or perhaps even refine it. So as they play our model of the way a city works, and they compare it to their internal middle model of the way a city works, um, 
that's in essence what we're really building. We're really building these middle models in our users' minds. Uh, the computer model becomes kind of a compiler for the middle model. This is basically called learning. This is the way learning occurs, is you're comparing your internal model of the world against reality or some other model and refining it. So in most people's situation, they don't have the opportunity to plan a city and see it evolve over decades. Uh, by compressing time and space, we allow them to have that opportunity and therefore allow them to start reevaluating their mental model. And especially you see this with kids, uh, young teenagers, their models are very malleable and very uh, unformed. And so it's really an eye-opener for them to play these simulations. And then they walk away from the game, and then when they're out in the real world, they start seeing things totally differently. They have a new paradigm for understanding the world. And it's really remarkable to see an eight-year-old play SimCity and then walk away and start noticing zoning in their town. What we're trying to give the user is a, a substrate that they can build really neat things with. Um, and then they have an ownership. Uh, they build this thing and it's their city or their ant colony or whatever. And they empathize with it. Because they built it, because they created every little road in that city, they care about what happens to it. And this is a very different dynamic than if you plop them into a world and say blast aliens. Um, you know, so they blast aliens, do they really care? They weren't really that involved to begin with. They're just pulling the trigger and occasionally hitting something. When they actually design something, and it's something that they envisioned, maybe they're, you know, it's a, their implementation of their dream city, that empathy with it um, engages them, I think, much more effectively than other techniques. And that's one of our real strengths with our users. We start with a, uh, an idea, usually a subject, that uh, then we will research for several months. Um, at some point we start getting a sense of what the user's interaction with the system is going to be, you know, why is it going to be fun. And then we start the process of building the model. Uh, and we have to take a very um, layered approach to building these models because the kind of simulations we do are generally social simulations as opposed to vehicle simulations or whatnot. Uh, social simulations really are a lot more difficult to build than something like a flight simulator, which is much more straightforward. So we start with the core behaviors, we get those tuned, and then we start layering on more and more subtle behaviors. And the process of building that model is probably one of the most critical skills we have in the marketplace. So the process of designing a game is very much like climbing up a tree. Every branch is a, a potential decision point, a different way the design can go. Uh, based on our experience and guided by intuition, we're getting better and better at knowing which branches we should take, both on a technical level, um, what structure, what data structure do I use to simulate a particular thing, but also on the user interaction level, you know, what fundamental dynamics are more entertaining, more fun to play with. Every simulation we do, we basically build from the ground up. And really, it's the experience we have in how to build these models that gives us efficiency. If we tried to reuse the same code over and over, it would be of very little help. But the fact that we know just the right order to build and tune the models saves us a lot of time and a lot of experimentation. So uh, every model is custom built for its particular purpose and is as efficient as we can possibly make it. I just know what kind of games I like to play. I mean, in, in essence, that is kind of... Uh, the way I go about it is, what do I want to play? What kind of game would I really enjoy? And uh, it's really hard to go back and say, what would this person like? I know he doesn't like what I like, so I'm going to have to think, put myself in his mindset and design a game that he would like. A lot of people do that, and they fail miserably. Um, really, the best games I've seen were designed by people designing it for themselves. This is really very much of an art, not a science at all. Uh, on some level, it's a science engineering the software for particular behaviors. But the user interaction and why somebody finds these fun is very much an art. Um, and that's where past experience is probably the most valuable thing to bring to the task. As people investigate 
chaos theory, what they're really looking at are the underlying principles through which a system behaves. Um, chaotic systems, as most people know, are very sensitive systems that can swing in wildly different directions based on very minor differences at the outset. A lot of systems that we deal with on a common basis, you know, human social systems, cities, traffic, are basically chaotic. Um, you know, one accident on the freeway can cause a huge traffic jam and gridlock over a large area. So, people deal with chaos in the real world all the time, um, but very rarely do they see the mechanisms and the envelope of behavior of these chaotic systems, and that's what we allow them to explore in our software. Um, and a related aspect of that is what's known as emergent behavior, where you can take very simple rules, and by combining them, you get very elaborate behavior. And this is really the essence of our models. Rather than building an incredibly complicated model uh, in sort of a system dynamics approach, we tend to fall back to more of a uh, emergent cellular dynamics approach, where we can encode very simple rules in just the right way and with the right balances. So you get a very complex system that's every bit as unpredictable as reality. And that's in large part, that's where the, uh, the real feeling of our models comes from. Well, I started working on SimCity back in 1985. Um, it originally evolved from a game I did earlier, which was blowing up these islands, cities, roads. And I had to develop an editor to develop the islands to blow up. And I found I had a lot more fun creating the islands than destroying them. So I kept working and working on this program that created the islands. And I started to study some of the urban models that had been done back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, SimCity sort of evolved out of that. What's neat about it is that they have to come up with their own goals. In SimCity, we don't say you have to do this to win, or if you do that, you lose. The first thing you have to do when you sit down is decide what do you want. Do you want the happiest citizens? Or do you want the biggest city? Um, do you want the most aesthetically pleasing layout? So just having to sit down and go through your own value judgments, I think, uh, is something that most people don't do when they play computer games. What we also were trying to do was to increase the amount of creativity a user could put into the system. So there are really a lot more parameters you can adjust in the new SimCity versus the old one. Uh, and I'm hoping that people will just sort of go wild with their creativity and create some really bizarre things.